Hey, I'm D-Man, and I am a guy who just got out of the shower. <laughs> What's up, everybody? D-Man back. Welcome to a brand new video, and welcome to our first review for Monarch Legacy of Monsters. This is my review for Monarch Legacy of Monsters Season 1, Episode 1, titled Aftermath. <laughs> Full spoilers for episode one of Monarch Legacy of Monsters. If you're new to these kind of episode to episode reviews that I do on this channel, I try and review each episode as its own individual product because I think that's important and it's a good way to engage with the material that the filmmakers have given us. I don't go like beat by beat, I don't go plot by plot. Instead, I just kind of rattle off thoughts that I had while I was watching the episode. The show starts out on Skull Island in a montage that places us directly inside the events of the 2017 film. We get an abbreviated version of our arrival on Skull Island in 1970 before running straight into Kong, the king of the monsters, uh, the eighth wonder of the world. It's super fascinating to me that in a show billed as a Godzilla show, the very first kaiju we see on screen, the very first titan happens to be King Kong, but I loved it. Even though it's just archival footage and it's exactly the archival footage I predicted would appear in this show, still made me incredibly happy to see Kong's face. He's just wonderful and I loved being placed right back inside the 2017 film. We then get a look at what I think is a brand brand new shot of soldiers running around. These are recreated soldiers from Kong Skull Island and they have been very faithfully recreated as I believe we can see Cole's, Relis, and even Cole because we can see Cole's AK so we know it's Cole. I guess we're to believe that during the Mother Longlegs attack Randa runs off only to start vlogging himself and then finds himself being chased by yet another Mother Longlegs so there were two in that bamboo forest attacking them. He drops his camera and it's destroyed but his footage must survive because Monarch eventually has it in Godzilla King of the Monsters so maybe he winds up carrying the footage around even though the camera's destroyed which is fine because he's not even carrying the camera in the original Mother Longlegs attack in Kong Skull Island so I'll give it a pass and say this guy's got an inventory slot for his camera and now his film reel and I'm just gonna say he probably gives it to Brooks at some point in between here and his death so that Brooks can bring it back to Monarch. The CGI is a little wonky here and I can't tell if it's because this is a CGI John Goodman like maybe he wasn't able to do all the running around because he's getting up there in age so they kind of CG'd his face on someone else's body or maybe it's a result of them not returning to Vietnam so this isn't a real location maybe they didn't even shoot this on location in Hawaii it could be possible that this is like in the volume or something I don't know something looked a little off about it but while it looked slightly janky I'll give it a pass because I absolutely loved this sequence I loved returning on foot to Skull Island in the thick of it I loved being back in the danger I love that film and I love returning to it this felt like a more genuine return to Skull Island Island than we have seen in Godzilla vs. Kong, so I was very happy to revisit what felt like a familiar real Skull Island. It also feels more like Skull Island than the Skull Island anime, so I was just really happy to be back. I'm not convinced Randa was near enough to a beach for this scene to even make sense, given that it didn't seem the bamboo forest was on the coastline, but I'll give it a pass because the inclusion of the massive trapdoor crab from the Skull Island anime absolutely blew my mind so much that it justified this entire sequence. I cannot believe they included that into a live action MonsterVerse project. Wow. Like, I never thought any of the comic books or the animated stuff would ever be acknowledged in even such a small, subtle way as this. But I loved seeing it, even though the design is different. I actually thought it was a lot cooler. The fight was a lot of fun. And this was a great little kaiju battle to open up the show here. It was lots of fun, even though the Mother Longlegs proved she is just an alien freak who was never meant to leave her forest because she looks so weird running around and, like, she moves so fast. It's so strange to watch, but I liked the little fight. It was a lot of fun. And this whole message in a bottle thing, I'm never a big fan of that because it always feels very unrealistic to me, but it's fine because this is not the first time it's been done in the MonsterVerse, nor is it the first time it's been done on Skull Island as that's how Skull Island, the birth of Kong kind of operates as well. And I like that it just kind of ties back into the fact that Monarch has this kind of flotation technology to get their stuff out to see if they ever need to. I loved seeing John Goodman back as Randa. I loved the little message he records. I hope his son got to watch it. And I really really enjoyed what I saw here. I had a really good time with this opening. So in 2013, Randa's message in a bottle is discovered.
discovered. It eventually finds its way to Hiroshi. So I'm wondering if that has something to do with where Hiroshi has to go after G-Day. Like maybe there's something in Randa's notes that he's trying to track down some other Titan that he's trying to investigate, maybe kill or stop from awakening or something. Because Randa has clearly been investigating Titans throughout his entire life as we see in this show. Well, I like the way that the intro sequence for this show kind of shows the dual lives that Hiroshi lives. It plays upon the split nature of this show going between the USA and Japan. And it also kind of builds the idea that this series is split in time. I just don't like the intro. It lacks energy and does not live up to the title sequences from the MonsterVerse so far. They are incredibly iconic and really not that hard to replicate. So it's very underwhelming to watch what they came up with for this series. The radiation decontamination on the plane, the Godzilla shelters, and the PTSD that Kate is struggling with. This is all exactly the type of world building, the heavy public reactions and personal stakes that I have been desperate for in the MonsterVerse. This is the kind of stuff I was begging for in a sequel to Godzilla 2014, and I am so freaking happy they decided to do it here. The Godzilla shelters, name dropping of Gojira, the emphasis on the fear of Godzilla. It just makes me so happy, and I'm so happy we go back to Japan because it feels like Godzilla has gone home for the first time ever in the MonsterVerse. The reveal that this show was set in 2015 is absolutely insane to me. I don't know why they made that call. Godzilla hasn't been seen since 2014 in Godzilla King of the Monsters, other than by Monarch themselves, and the news report implies that neither have any other Titans. That means that whatever kaiju show up in this show, they can't do a whole lot in the modern day in public because then it'll break continuity. It makes it even more limited than to just set this series directly after the events of 2014. So it's a bold call and I hope it pays off, but they have to pay extremely close attention to what they do now. One benefit of this is that we do get to see a bit more of the world building and the reaction to Godzilla, especially with the way Japan has responded to Godzilla in such a wonderful way. The way Japan responded is such a wonderful example of how the world would react to a Godzilla. The new Japanese city missile defense system is cutting edge and genuinely better than any other defenses we see in any other country or city in the MonsterVerse so far. This is also kind of a step in the direction to the way that the cities in Destroy All Monsters had built-in internal missile defense systems against the kaiju. Specifically in Tokyo, Tokyo was heavily fortified against the kaiju. Another thing I love about this is the way it mirrors Japan's real-world military policies being focused entirely on defensive capabilities, and it just built Godzilla up as a real threat and presence, and also is the kind of world building that has been missing from the MonsterVerse so far, and feels kind of like a plot hole that it never comes up in another MonsterVerse film. Like, where was this stuff in Boston? How did Hong Kong have no evacuation system going on? How did they not have any defensive capabilities? I mean, Hong Kong's supposed to be on the cutting edge. What is going on there? I thought the Taxi Man thinking Godzilla CGI is a fun nod to the way the characters brought to life in the real world. And it's also kind of a fun world building element that I really loved because of course there's going to be skeptics about literally everything. Okay, here's my big issue with the episode. It's that Kate is just a little unlikable to me. She treats her mom poorly. She treats Kentaro and Emiko poorly. She's kind of mean to everyone despite the fact that she's shown constant hospitality throughout this episode. And I get that she has trauma, but it's not a very likable way to introduce a character for me. On the flip side of that, Emiko and Kentaro quickly stole the show for me, and the twist that Hiroshi was living a double life really landed for me. I did not see that coming. I also thought it landed for me more than it seemed to land for Kate, seeing as though only Emiko and Kentaro seemed to have a strong reaction to that news. Maybe it's because Kate was kind of on to him the whole time, but she just didn't feel vindicated when she found out. She was kind of like, oh, anyways. I also think it's absolutely whack that Kate just tries to leave without getting any answers or giving any answers about what's going on. I mean, they think the guy's dead. They think he died from Godzilla and she knows otherwise and she's just not gonna tell them. What are you doing, Kate? Just be nice, just be nice. And I get it, you know, it's like, why would she be nice to a person that her dad was cheating on her family with and to this whole estranged family? But at the same time, it's like, they didn't do anything to you, he did. Be mad at him, not them. I thought the Godzilla evacuation drill was absolutely fantastic. Again, that's the type of world building I really want to see in the MonsterVerse. And Emiko and Kentaro really win my heart by helping Kate out there. I'm not sure how they found her, but I don't care. The flashback to 2014, this is going to be the big talking point of the episode, I'm sure. It was fantastic, but problematic. It's so epic. I love love the first clip of Godzilla colliding with the bridge while we're in the bus. It's absolutely horrifying and has that 2014 sense of scale, but then Godzilla kind of gets stuck on the bridge or something? He can't make it through? Like, it just doesn't line up with the 2014 film at all. In fact, I have tried three ways to re-edit this scene that I'll cover in a different video probably just for fun. That video is not going to make any money. Can't monetize that one. But I've re-edited that clip three different ways and it just, it never works. Also, there's little things like the shot of Kate launching from the bus. It's just a little off to me. She moves 
a little fast. <laughs> On the whole, I want to emphasize that the whole scene is really, really cool. It plays out with great dramatic tension and weight. It's heavy and horrific. And while it does check all of the boxes for what makes a great Godzilla sequence for me, it misses the mark for me because I'm like a wannabe MonsterVerse filmmaker. I want to get in on these things. And it frustrates me when small continuity things are overlooked. I would not have overlooked that. <laughs> There's ways to make this whole sequence work. You just have to change some tiny little details. This whole scene just doesn't line up with the scene from 2014. While it is aesthetically perfect, it looks magnificent. The color grading is like what 2014 used to look like when we watched it in theaters, but no longer looks like on the DVD. It's just beautiful. They've recreated the entire atmosphere so perfectly, and Godzilla's design is wonderfully recreated, but the timing is all off. Godzilla uses the wrong hand to grab onto the Golden Gate's suspension wire. He collides with the bridge at a weird point where it's like too early, and then he just gets stuck on it. It gives the feeling that Godzilla is stiff and wooden, like he no longer slices through the bridge like a hot knife through butter, but instead he just kind of loiters around until he's told to move it along. He also moves kind of awkwardly, like he roars and then he kind of like bulks up in a weird way, which I kind of liked because it made him move like a suit or Shin Godzilla. <laughs> but at the same time, that wasn't the way that the 2014 Godzilla was moving. He just... <laughs> collides straight through the bridge. The sequence also just kind of happens a little too fast for me. I would have started much sooner before Godzilla even shows up because as Hitchcock always said, if you know there's a Godzilla under the bridge, then the bus ride suddenly has suspense. Something like that, right? <laughs> you read Hitchcock Truffaut? Is that what the book's called? <laughs> Point is, I would have given that sequence a little more time to breathe, but I appreciated what it did for the episode as it gave Kate a lot of emotional baggage and weight, and I really liked the way it tied into her PTSD being trapped in the Godzilla shelter. The way Emiko comforts Kate after this was so touching, it made me so sad the way that Kate does not reciprocate that kindness and in the very next scene tries to abandon Emiko. Really rude, man. I'm not sure what Kentaro's point was showing Kate that Hiroshi worked with satellites considering he doesn't really know any specifics about what his his father was up to, nor did he have anything in that office to point to in order to prove whatever point he was trying to prove. What was he even trying to do with that? Whatever he was trying to prove was more of for the plot than it was for Kate. This scene felt like it could have been done better if it had just been changed up a little more. For instance, I think it would have been more compelling if Kentaro had already found the lockbox built into the wall but just didn't know how to open it. And instead of saying, hey Kate, come look at this, my father was a good guy and I'll prove it, he said, there's something going on with our father that we don't know about. Follow me, let's figure this out together because we can find out if this guy truly was an asshole or if he was a great guy. That would be a more compelling motivation for him if he had some uncertainty about it as well. Kate also finds out that combination like impossibly fast. I think it would have been more interesting if she found out the order of the birthdays and then ordered it based on age. That would have been a more interesting way for her to discover that because she finds that out like really quickly in a way that I just didn't make sense to me. But I like that it shows Hiroshi truly did love and care for both of his families regardless of the fact that he was cheating on both of them. Like they clearly meant a lot to him and I want to give the guy the benefit of the doubt and say whatever he's doing for Monarch he was trying to do it for the betterment of the world and maybe he's just like an Oppenheimer where he's just a little unfaithful. <laughs> Monarch needs to stop branding every single thing that they come in contact with with their symbol because it completely gives them away every single time. This is very in character for Monarch starting in Godzilla King of the Monsters and in Godzilla vs Kong so I have no issues with it. I just think it's really silly. <laughs> like why does Monarch have to give themselves away so often? May feels like she walked out of a teen drama and I'm not really sure how I feel about the character, there's absolutely nothing wrong with the performance. I want to stress that. I just think the character's kind of written meh. She kind of feels cringe like a bit of a Fortnite kid, especially with the way she hacks that computer, her mannerisms and her dialogue. It's just very Fortnite kid-esque. I think that this character could easily be redeemed because she has almost all redeeming qualities. It's just she's a little 90s hacker cringe Jurassic Park style, which is fine. It just kind of felt out of place for every other character in this episode for me. Bill Randa's file also really confused me. Like that can't just be Randa's file or it has some sort of magic technology where it can tap into Monarch's modern day file systems. Also, I don't know how Monarch was even able to track them in the first place when those files were being accessed considering they were being accessed on an analog drive, nor am I sure why they think May blocked their trackers after only sampling a bit of the data considering May did not stop sampling data. She was 
continuing to open files after the monarch alert went through and then we're told that like they only downloaded a little bit and then they realized we were on them and then they stopped and they just didn't so makes me think that maybe another character was involved with that because it's possible that like for instance lee shaw saw that thing get opened and knew that a monarch alert had been sent out and blocked it from going through to monarch any further because he's kind of wanting that data to be opened could be also that can't be the randa files because those randa files contain a picture of the skull devil who was still in hibernation at the time he was killed so there's no way he could have taken a picture of it and put it on that drive he also threw his bag into the water before he had even met a skull crawler that means that this must be hiroshi's data and he was using randa's old analog drives for some reason i'm not entirely sure why we do see some fun teasers for future episodes here as we get a look at the gadget that the monarch boys climb in in the trailer we see the bat kaiju we also see the ship that tips over in the trailer we see the godzilla nuke and bigfoot in the monsterverse that was a really fun little detail that they included that i really loved that cryptids exist in the monsterverse so much fun i really hope we get to see some of that stuff in future episodes that would be a great little spin-off if instead of focusing on the titans this show focused on like hey there's cryptids in this world too and they also cause danger that'd be really fun i'd be really into that there's something really fun about tim as well i don't know why but i think i'm really gonna like that character a lot this flashback to the 2014 aftermath it was a great scene that i could have used more of i really appreciated seeing the direct impact of the 2014 events even though the destruction seen on the buildings and in the skyline is not consistent with the 2014 film <laughs> and also the sales first tower should not be in this episode <laughs> that thing just wasn't built in 2014 so get it out of here i don't really think kate has a very compelling reason to hate her father he showed up and gave her and her mother a place to go said that they should go there i'm assuming he wanted to meet them there and that he had important stuff to do and then he ran off and i get that that's a reason to be upset with him but not really to hate him like she doesn't know what he was in the middle of i guess as far as she's aware she didn't know if he was running off to cheat on her mom again but if that is the reason she hates him it's not very well developed i thought she seems way less hung up on the fact that hiroshi had been cheating on her family for his entire life and more hung up on the fact that he just kind of left after the battle of san francisco but i guess it's hard for me to relate to her feelings because i know that he's looking into monarch maybe he's not even a part of it maybe he just found bill randa's bag and he's just looking into it but i think he is part of monarch but i know how important monarch's work is and so i know that whatever he's doing it's probably very important following g-day i don't think he's dead by the way they said he's dead i guarantee you he's not he shows up in the trailer with the gadget so i don't think he's dead it's also super interesting that monarch's not public yet i'm assuming that the characters in this show could expose monarch to the public and that could lead into the trials we see in godzilla king of the monsters where monarch is being put on public blast for the first time ever i love the godzilla footprint photo it's very 1954 1998 of them the reveal that they were related to keiko it was something that i guess i had already figured out before now so i was kind of surprised that it was treated as a reveal in fact the only thing that i thought was a reveal was the fact that both of them are related to keiko which means they're both the grandchildren of bill randa not just kate who i had assumed kate's mother was the one related to bill randa i guess that means hiroshi is randa's son and his name is hiroshi randa so i guess that means he's kentaro randa and kate randa or maybe kentaro reverted to his mother's maiden name or something I'm not sure maybe hiroshi used two different last names to cover up his tracks i don't know another thing i don't know and you might be wondering when i was going to get to this stuff is why does this episode have to jump around to 1959 so much it doesn't have anything to do with the story being told in the modern day it felt like they had to do it in this episode because it's setting up things that they are going to develop in later episodes but i felt that the structure of this episode could have benefited more from either telling them all in one go or making them thematically tie into each other a little more because as it stood we just kind of jumped around for seemingly no real reason the kazakhstan stuff sees a young bill randa lisha and keiko visiting a radiation containment zone and i found the banter and the dialogue between the cast here to be lots of fun albeit a little heavy-handed at times this was a fantastic cast with everyone being very charismatic and this was the stuff in the pilot that really landed for me this was the plot line that had me hooked i'm not yet sold on anders holm as a young bill randa yet but he's got time to simmer i don't know what's throwing me off i think it might be the voice but i'm sure i will warm up to him because he's pretty likable i love the way that shaw is also just this soldier who's tagging along with them and doesn't understand or have time for all their science talk my favorite scenes when he detonates the bombs before they're ready that's great stuff also i just want to shout out keiko because i thought she was wonderful i'm not a big fan of the love triangle that they've clearly set up here i think that's going to cause some drama between randa and shaw in later episodes and i just don't care <laughs> let randa be happy shaw go get your own woman even if she was with you first man move on she clearly is happy i'm surprised that keiko took off her mask considering she's a scientist they had just detected so much radiation prior but i also guess i understand why they did it because they wanted to show how compassionate she is to that young boy so it did work in terms of characterization but it just felt like weird why would she do that i did like the eventual realization that the radiation they were being warned about
about does not exist because it mirrored Joe's realization in Godzilla 2014. I'm not sure what they were exactly investigating or where this was, because at first it seemed like it was supposed to be Chernobyl, which is in a similar geological region, although Chernobyl and Kazakhstan are not really all that close together at all, nor had the Chernobyl accident occurred yet. I mean, it was decades out at this point. As far as the MonsterVerse goes, the only incident that had been previously reported in 1959 until now was the Siberian Mystery, and that basically boils down to Monarch established a containment zone that nobody knows what it does. So this is all new stuff that we're exploring here. Like I said, the bombing scene, it was so much fun. It's a great callback to Kong Skull Island and shows that Randa's methods never really changed, despite the fact that they don't work out for him in either case. There's also really fun banter here. I love the way that Shaw just resolves all the banter by blowing up the charges regardless of if they're efficient or not, but I thought the scientific banter was actually a lot of fun. I don't know what this bug's nest is that they found. I love it. It's a very Muto aesthetic. Reminds me of the Muto's nest a lot, which I loved. The whole scene was lots of fun, although they're not Muto's guys. You don't know how big those things get, so you can't call them Muto's yet. Unless the M in Muto, the massive in Muto, just refers to a thing that's larger than it should be, and I guess in this case, they are massive bugs. They're just not that massive, especially when you compare them to like a massive bug like Scylla or the Mother Longlegs. Again, I actually really liked the bickering and the banter in this scene. I like that it's broken up by someone else taking charge. That's why three-man groups are so compelling, and I really hope we get to see more of this three-man group moving forward. Keiko is a total badass. I love seeing her take charge. It's also lots of fun to see her make that call because it shows that she's very heroic and brave. I like that Keiko is approaching the spores and swabbing them. That felt very realistic and like something a real scientist would do. I'm sure that she could have taken other samples or like injected something into it. Maybe she just didn't get around to that stuff, but swabbing it made the most sense to me. They should both be wearing masks down there though. Like you don't know what's down there. Could be a face hugger for all you know. Put a mask on. Shaw is also such a heavy footed son of a bitch. Like he did not follow the scientific method at all here. Just stomping around, destroying the discoveries until the whole ground became unstable. Come on, dude. And I am sure there will be conflict in future episodes between Shaw and Randa about who was at fault for what happens at the end of this episode. But man, I'll tell you right now where I stand. You cannot blame Randa for Keiko's death. I fully blame Shaw for that. There's a few reasons why. First of all, Keiko said she needed both of them up there so that Randa could have support from Shaw and they could both help to pull her up in case things went south. Shaw then chooses to go down with her regardless anyways because he thinks that's a better way to protect her and clearly it wasn't. He then chooses to stomp around rather than sit tight and wait for her after he sees that the ground is unstable. Like, dude, just stay in place. Randa tries his absolute best to support Keiko and tries so hard to follow the mission. He cannot be blamed for this. He also can't be blamed for not being able to support the weight because not only was he lifting up a full grown woman, but he was also lifting up a billion bug monsters. Like the hell was he supposed to do, man? The ending of this episode was downright shocking to me as I fully expected Keiko to stick around following this point. I am certain she will appear in later episodes as we've already seen more promotional photos of her, albeit they have to happen at different points in history now. Also, I kind of expected her to just kind of die peacefully in between episodes or during a time skip or something. Did not think she would die in such a gruesome, horrific way that definitely reminded me of Kong Skull Island where nobody gets out safe. Lastly, and this is the saddest of all, Randa can never be successful. If they want to keep continuity with Kong Skull Island, Randa can never prove the existence of the Hollow Earth nor the Titans. I mean, he really shouldn't have a concept of the Hollow Earth yet. He should only have a vague idea that maybe there's some pockets on the ground that are empty. And he kind of discovers that in this episode. But he can never prove the Hollow Earth, nor can he prove the Titans. If they want to keep continuity intact, Monarch can never have definitive proof to present to the government other than Godzilla. Godzilla is the only Titan that they can have definitive proof of, and any other monsters probably bigger than these bugs in this episode can never have successful proof come out of it. Again, just a nitpick that I brought up in a previous video. They shouldn't call them Titans yet. The term Titan didn't come about until the gap between 2014 and 2019. We don't know when that term came about, but until then, every monster is a super species, a muto, or just a monster. You can't call them Titans until in between 2014 and King of the Monsters. They've thrown that out the window within this first episode, so retcon time. Now Monarch has always called them Titans. We just never knew that until now. That's not a big deal. It's just a little frustrating because it does not follow the lore we have been informed of up to this point. But on the whole, I want to say I really enjoyed this episode. I loved seeing Kong at the top. I liked the Godzilla scene quite a bit, even though it just didn't follow the timing that it needed to. I'll say it's because she's misremembering it. Those are her memories, and her memories are clouded by the fear of the moment. She doesn't remember how fast things happen. I mean, that's actually a true thing that happens with trauma. You remember, you process differently than it really occurred. So she was dealing with a lot of trauma. I'll give her a pass for that. She's just misremembering. What really happened is Godzilla sliced through that bridge. 
she was already out of the bus when he did it and that bus went down in seconds that's what really happened <laughs> that's the only way but overall i really like the episode i like the characters i think it's a very interesting setup again i like the small personal stakes i like the scale so far my favorite characters go emiko keiko kentaro shaw randa and then i'll say kate sorry kate <laughs> just be nice to people and i think she will be i think as time goes on she'll warm up to everybody and she'll be nicer that's kind of her coming out of her shell again so I i'm here for it i support you kate i will let you vent i'll go through this process with you and we'll get you back to normal in no time what did you think of monarch legacy of monsters episode one aftermath were you underwhelmed with it or like me were you satisfied with it did it give you kind of exactly what you were expecting from it comment below and let me know what you thought i'm super curious to hear how people respond to this show until then i want to give a huge thank you to all my patrons over on patreon thank you guys so much for the support i get on the patreon it really means a lot and goes a long way towards making sure i can keep making videos like this for you guys if you want to support the patreon you can use the link in the description below where you can get early access to content access to the discord community and more i would also like to give a big thank you to apple tv plus for hooking me up with the screeners for this episode so i really appreciated being able to watch it early so i could review it with you guys thank you guys all for watching i hope you enjoyed i will see you guys next time we're gonna do more coverage for this show so tune in again i'll see you guys next time for the next one d-man out